know, just hire them. And Bill Mitchell wants to hire people to have lifeguards on the beach that can teach surfing. I think that's an excellent idea. You know, much better than having more lawyers or more stockbrokers call me up. I'd much rather have people <laughs> helpful on the beach by a factor of a thousand, okay? <laughs> so I named the new currency the kilt. And you know why? No idea. Oh. <laughs> okay, what's the first thing everybody asks about a currency? They want to know what's behind it, right? I'm going to call it the kilt. What I have said is that this campaign is not just about electing a president. It is about making a political revolution. NMT. Taking money from our children and borrowing from China. People are dying. Is the program so critical, it's worth borrowing money from China to pay for it? And if not, I'll get rid of it. Stop lying! I want the truth! Now, let's see if we can avoid the apocalypse altogether. Here's another episode of Macro and Cheese with your host, Steve Grumbine. All right, and this is Steve with Macro and Cheese. Today is a follow-up, part two of our interview with Warren Mosler, the originator of modern monetary theory, or MMT, right now. So within the concept of interest rates and so forth, I guess that brings us to the big elephant in the room, and that is the current situation with COVID-19. I thought you were going to say the job guarantee. Well, yeah, the job we guarantee is... about that. You, you know talk what? about core MMT. You know, let me talk about core MMT and the job guarantee because everybody argues about whether or not it's core. Yes. Okay. So I don't use the word core MMT for that job guarantee. What I say is, what is the base case for analysis? Okay, so you start with the base case, and that's the money story. Government puts a tax on, hires people they want. Okay, that's the base case. We have a zero interest rate policy because there's no reason to pay interest, like what Pompeii did or what the British did in Africa. That's the base case for analysis. It's a zero interest rate policy. They're just spending. We talked about Pompeii, right? Absolutely. Yes, we went through that. Yeah. You know, I talked about somebody with it yesterday. I want to make sure I'm not. <laughs> you <laughs> know nailed it. Talk to you about. Yeah, it. okay. So Pompeii, that's the base case. They need public service people. They put a tax on your house. People show up. They hire them, okay? Then we talked about, well, what if there's more people than they wanted to show up for work? What do they do? Okay, well, they want to reduce taxes. Either want to hire them, which is fine, and then they don't have excess people. But if they want more people growing food and making wagon wheels and whatever else, making pizza, and fewer people in the public sector, understandable. You need a certain amount of people doing private sector type things. Unless you want to move it all in the public sector. But, you know, if you want it in the private sector, I'm not going to get an argument on whether pizza making should be public or private. But if you want it in the private sector, then you want to send those people back to the private sector. So here we are in our base case, but the private sector doesn't want to hire them because once they've been unemployed, the way we treat unemployed, they're damaged goods, okay? And the private sector only wants to hire people who are already working. They way prefer that. And all the studies show that. In fact, anecdotally in the 2008 recession, there were ads saying, you know, help wanted, but unemployed need not apply. <laughs> so it's yes. not always the case, but it's enough of the case where it's a major problem of getting unemployed back to work because their work habits aren't there anymore. They haven't had a place to go to show up on time. They don't know they're clean or if they get in fights or they're on drugs or whatever. It's expensive to hire somebody and then lose them and you got to go through the process again. And there are barriers to hiring and firing people, you know, a lot of resistance to having to do that. It's a very unpleasant thing to have to let people go and replace them. It's very disruptive. So they'd rather hire people already working with a good track record so because their odds of success are better. So to help that process along, these unemployed, we put them in a transition job, a job guaranteed job, with the idea that this is going to promote the transition of these people back because we made a mistake. The tax was higher than we wanted. We didn't want them in the public sector. But we extracted them through the tax liability and 
We're going to hire them, and then we're going to facilitate the transition back to the private sector. Now, if we decide we want to hire them for a Green New Deal, great. You know, I'm 100% in favor of that. Just hire them, pay them normal federal pay scales, normal state and local pay scales, fund the state and local governments to do it. But, you know, just hire them. And Bill Mitchell wants to hire people to have lifeguards on the beach that can teach surfing. I think that's an excellent idea. You know, much better than having more lawyers or more stockbrokers calling me up. I'd much rather have people <laughs> helpful on the beach by a factor of a thousand, okay? Okay, then some of these private sector jobs are, you know, door to door salesmen. I really don't want those people bothering me. I'd rather have them out on the beach teaching my kids how to surf. So hire them, you know, properly fund the public sector and hire them if you come up with any ideas like that. Okay, but once we've adequately provisioned the public sector and we've decided we still do need people in the private sector doing this commercial activity, the transition job is to promote them to the private sector. So if somebody asks, what are all these people going to do? Oh, they're going to transition into the private sector. That's the point. What if they don't? Well, it means taxes are too high. Then we'll lower your taxes until they do. That's a good thing for you, isn't it? You know, or we'll have more public services for you until they transition. That's a good thing. We're going to have more government spending or lower taxes, which are good things for all you guys asking me these questions. And we're going to do that until we get these people to transition. So what's your problem now? Well, what are they actually going to do? Oh, well, you know, one of my suggestions is we open up the federal, state, and local governments to be able to hire transition workers on a $15 an hour transition wage to help them out with areas that might need help, knowing that a good chance we're going to keep fiscal policy loose enough where these people are going to be transitioning away from them and take jobs in the private sector. And if you want to keep them in the public sector because you like them and they're doing good work, fine apply to your supervisors to expand your department to hire these additional people. And, you know, we're prepared to fund it because, you know, we want the public sector to do a good job. Okay. So that's one thing that they're going to do. Another thing is we can open up all the nonprofits, the American Heart Association, American Cancer Society. You want to hire people instead of working as volunteers, we'll pay them as transition workers, $15 an hour, which we should have been doing anyway. But remember, they're going to be stuffing envelopes for you for a while, but at some point, good chance, private sector is going to hire them away because we're going to keep loose fiscal policy in place to make sure the job guarantee pool is at a minimum. If unemployment's at 5%, job guarantee can be at 2%, do the same heavy lifting in terms of price stability, price anchor, because it's a much more liquid buffer stock because people are employed rather than unemployed. They're very attractive to the private sector. Okay, and that's how I answer those questions. I don't start going into all the wonderful things job guarantee people can do because all those wonderful things are on my list of people we ought to hire in the private sector anyway, you know, whether there's a job guarantee or not. I'm not trying to save money for the public sector by hiring job guarantee people at $15 an hour instead of $60,000 a year people to do the work. It's not the point. Right. Otherwise it becomes a highly regressive policy for provisioning the public sector. Yeah, because now instead of hiring people at a wage commensurate with their skill, et cetera, now you're basically actually providing a pay cut. Yeah. And they say, well, we're not going to replace anybody. And when people leave, we're still going to replace them with this. But if you're hiring new people to do new jobs, it's the same thing, you know, but I don't like it. You know, I, it, it's a step in the wrong direction for no reason. What's the purpose of doing that? To save money in the public sector? And this is the whole point of modern monetary theory. Indeed you don't need does. to do that. Right. Okay. And so when I see MMT proponents talking like that, like you're missing the whole point. Now, some of the other MMT proponents, who are some of the leading names that you interviewed, have an agenda, which I don't disagree with necessarily, which is they'd like to have the public sector do all this work and not the private sector. They don't like capitalism the way we have it. There's certain things, maybe lemonade stands or something, but they basically want the public sector to be doing all this work. So profit motive isn't there, which they don't believe serves public purpose. And so one way to do that is to start with a job guarantee, get all these people in there, and then have them expand into doing more and more enterprises that the private sector is doing now until we transition to more of a public sector economy. So their idea is not just hire these people to help them transition. You know, it's not to just hire the people we need in the public sector first and then help transition because they think that's politically naive. There's a war going on out there. Okay. And so if you do it my way, 
we will not adequately provision the public sector because of this ideological war. And we will not have lifeguards that can help out, which I'd like to see. The only way we're going to get that is to make them job guaranteed jobs and then transition them into regular public service jobs. So they see it used in that avenue. Okay. And I don't disagree with that. But I say, if that's what you want to do, just say it. You know, be intellectually honest about it. Well, we can't do that because then it won't happen because we're fighting this war. And when you're fighting this war, you can't disclose your tactics like that or you're going to lose it. I say, okay, you know, I can respect that, but, you know, it's not what I do. I'm looking at it from the academic point of view. Like, we're all Americans looking out for what's best for everybody. And, you know, it is majority rule, so to speak. I know the minority rights on that, but it is some kind of a representative government. And I think there'll be pressures through the representatives because a majority of the people are not the 1%. That's why it's called the 1%, not the 51%. It's the 1%. <laughs> if they had the 51% with everything, then I say, okay, they're probably going to stay in control. But if it's the 1%, there's an avenue open for the 99% to vote for somebody else. Now, I know the 1% influences them through all kinds of things, but they're still the 1%. They're still outnumbered. And so there's that aspect of the job guarantee of some, you know, fairly aggressive MMT proponents out there. I talked to, there was another one, you know, we were talking about the Fed and monetary operations and the swap lines. And I pointed out the, the absurdity of the swap lines and he goes, yeah, but, you know, the swap lines are a way for the Fed to fund aggregate demand and spending on goods and services overseas, you know, by providing swap lines for countries like Mexico or Bangladesh, those countries, instead of just using that money the way the headlines intended to be used, which is financial assets, they could take that money and buy real assets and support full employment and all this other stuff in all these other countries. I go, well, yeah, that's fiscal spending and that's the realm of Congress. You know, if Congress wants to support full employment in Mexico or Bangladesh or Canada or New York, you know, they can do it. They don't, they don't need the Fed to come up with subterfuge of using swap lines for financial assets that get redirected into goods and services. He says, well, yeah, but well, Congress will never do that. We have the Fed giving swap lines, then there's a chance, you know, we could get it done through that avenue. It's like, okay, <laughs> look, you believe in representative government or you don't, right? And you believe in an informed electorate or you don't. And I personally support the informed electorate approach. So I want the electorate to be informed on public versus private, you know, in terms of job guarantee and transition and hire the people you want and Fed swap lines are funding financial assets and, you know, real assets are different. And, you know, the informed approach would to have Congress do that because it affects our supply and demand of real goods and services over here where the financial doesn't. So, you know, things are like, let's just say developing in that direction just like they have with Keynes and with Marx and with everybody else. So it's not an unusual thing. He had a Russian revolution in the name of Marx, which had nothing to do with Marx, right? <laughs> what would you say to the power yeah. dynamic, though? I think one of the big yeah, concerns yeah. you hear is the fact yeah. that the power dynamic is so skewed as it comes to labor's ability to organize, labor's ability to yeah. fight back voters, being able to get through a primary without having someone's thumb put on it. On and on and on. It yeah. doesn't really represent the representative government that you had. Well, look, you know, I might talk about. I'm, I think I'm in the real world, and labor unions worked for supporting wages of that particular union at the expense of other labor. So, like when I grew up in Connecticut, Pratt and Whitney had a strong union, and people sweeping the floor in Pratt and Whitney were making three dollars an hour, where people sweeping the floor in the grocery stores were making a dollar twenty-five an hour. And that was huge. Well, you know, one was supporting his family and sending his kids to school and had two cars, and the other was barely getting by. And so you had that problem. Then you have massive corruption problems in labor unions. The union leaders and the membership and what they do with their pension funds and everything else is, you know, and their political influence is legendary, right? And so, yes, I know labor needs support or else real wages go to zero because it's not a fair game. And labor unions are one way to get that support. But there are other ways. And I vastly prefer the job guarantee to labor unions to support labor. 
and other legislation for institutional structure. And I think labor unions are good for working conditions and things like that. But you don't want the heavy money going through those things because we don't have the ability to control it or regulate it. And it gets pretty rough. I mean, it comes down to like real organized crime type problems. They weren't just isolated incidents. They were like everywhere. And so if you can come up with ways to overcome that, fine. But compliance is like critical. Yeah. With Bill Black and his work uncovering the banking industry and the fraud that goes on and so forth, I would suggest that there's already fraud going on. There's already unregulated fraud and stuff that is regulated is considered too big to jail. So people, regular people, voters, people that think they have a stake in the political world are being taken from every end of the spectrum. My fear is, is I see no support for them. That's my problem. I don't know where you find support because the politicians aren't doing it. Right. And so therefore there's no support for the job guarantee. There's no support for full employment and these other things, but I think there is. And then I come up with proposals to take the money out of politics, which, you know, is absolutely critical. That's where the root of this problem, right? You've heard my 60-40 proposal, right? Yes, yes. Okay, so everybody likes that. Nobody has any problem with it. Everybody agrees it will take the money out of politics. But it doesn't get past my conversation with you. And MMT proponents are not moving in that direction. They're not, you know, shouting that one out, which everybody likes. And yeah, it's not perfect as 60-40, but the concept is pretty good. And it doesn't solve every single problem, but it's, you know, you don't have to outrun the bear. I only have to outrun you. It solves 95% of the issues, okay? And taking the money out of politics, taking the advantages of money out of politics. And it's just massively transformational. And it can be adjusted, whatever you put in. If it's not quite right, it can be adjusted. Oh, what do you do if there's three or four parties? Okay, make adjustments. The states all do that. I can go up with the concept and we can come up with the concept. And the fine tuning is not that critical. And so, you know, there's nobody you like, moving in that direction. And I was doing that for a while, and then I got sidetracked recently trying to focus on this interest rate thing. Once I saw over the hill on the solvency issue, the next thing was the interest rate. But behind that all is getting the money out of politics, which is, I have not seen anything better than you know, my 60-40 approach. Can it's, you, you describe know, you any contributions to the listeners? Yeah, you make unlimited contributions to anybody you want, but and I'm just throwing out a number, 40% of whatever you contribute goes to the opposition. And that's it. There's no government money involved. And so if Koch brothers want to make a hundred million contribution to Trump, then fine, but 40 million goes to Biden. And number one, it's going to cut down on contributions, which is probably a good thing. But number two, it takes away the power of the contribution. And maybe 60-40 is wrong, maybe it needs to be 55-45, I don't know, whatever. But the idea that a substantial portion is going to the opposition takes that away. Now, they say, oh, the companies already give to both sides. Yes, but that makes both sides beholden because if they're not, they're not going to get it. This way, they're going to get it either way, whether they cater to the donor or not. So the yeah, opposition might get a little bit more, but they're still going to get a lot, even if they're you know, against them. And if they're against the Koch brothers, whatever they want to do, you know, burn more coal or something, then Trump might get. Out of 100 million, Trump gets 60 and you get 40. But now you can raise 20 million from the anti coal people a lot easier than you can raise 100 million, right? Today, right. Trump gets 100 million, you get zero. You got to go out and try and raise 100. Under this program, Trump gets 60, you get 40. Now you, you just got to have 20 million anti coal. It's a whole lot easier. And even with 40, you can be pretty effective in at least answering back what they're trying to shout, right? They're trying to like out advertise you. With 40, you're going to have a targeted, effective response in the markets you want. So it's easy to enforce and, you know, massive penalties for political candidate. You're just disqualified if you're not compliant and no government money involved, no politics involved, not favoring one side over the other. And it takes away a lot of what our politicians are doing, which is spending two thirds of their time raising money. It takes away that imperative. So it's got everything going for it. And again, And I've seen it proposed at the national level by some small group five or six years ago, and it never went anywhere. Right. You know, no major group has taken it on. But it seems like the elegant solution to, you know, get this thing going in the right direction. Because once you're there, now you're in an entirely different place, different context, to then make your next move on campaign finance. You can do that, 
and then see what the world looks like and then see if you need to make a further adjustment. Right. But I think without that, you're right. Without that, all the stuff we're talking about is out of nowhere going to get shot down. Right. And that's yeah, what's that, happening. It, out of it, nowhere, it, Biden's against the Green New Deal. It's like, where'd that come from? <laughs> because he was always right of Reagan. That's where he came from. He hasn't always been anywhere. You know that. And yeah, that's true. He's look, kind look, of look, ethereal. Trump, Trump has to go. And the way I can say is, you know, Trump was the price the voters were willing to pay to get rid of Clinton, to keep the Clintons out. And now Biden's the price the voters are willing to pay to get to Trump get out of there. Because he's, he's an absolute risk to the whole constitutional law and democratic process. With Trump in there, we're risking, you know, becoming Venezuela or Somalia, seriously. Because yes. of the way the rule of law is going. You just use a legal system to attack political opponents. That's just like, you know, so far out of bounds and so high risk in terms of losing our whole civilization. That's core. That's yeah. core America. How can you persecute whistleblowers? Like, what's this? <laughs> These are supposed to be heroes, you know? Obama did that, too. Obama did I know. that. I know, it, it, I know. It's devastating to, to me because you left with a gun I, to your I, I head. Don't, I don't care if they all did it. Trump's doing it now. So right. he's got to go. <laughs> and then if Biden's doing it, he's got to go. Well, not fair turning. enough. Okay, so let's take the next step because this is really important yeah. because Trump has failed miserably on the COVID-19 side. But then again, Congress has failed. Do you hear what somebody said? I read something that's cute. Said, I prefer presidents who don't get COVID. <laughs> <laughs> what was that? The lady that gave typhoid Mary or whatever it is. I mean, he, yeah, 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 yeah. he has literally, you know, gotten so many people infected through his actions or directly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It is pretty unfathomable. But it does bring me to the question. Clearly, the nation has been put on hold for a long time. And yeah. his response has been tepid at best. Congress has been woefully miserable as well. There are no good guys. Yeah. Their um, approval level is like 8% or something. <laughs> it, it's ridiculous. And these yeah, are supposed yeah. to be the quote unquote representatives of the people. And you look yeah. at this, neither side is, I'll just be honest, I see no heroes here. They're all worthless to me. And I wonder to myself aloud, maybe, why we didn't nationalize payroll like Pavlina had said. Why did we not provide emergency COVID payments? Why did we not yeah. do any of these things? Like even the mint the coin through Rashida Tlaib and Rohan working with yeah. those guys over there. Why did nothing happen? Literally nothing yeah, I thought happened. That, I, I thought that was equal chance of making it worse than making it better. Just it the point of like nothing it, happened. Nothing. That just, to me was more of a cause of nothing to happen. You know, it kept something from happening because it was such a gimmick type of thing of something that doesn't need that. You can do that without it. Right. It doesn't add anything to the solution to do that. There's no benefit to that except trying to make something look like, you know, running away from the police when you're not guilty doesn't <laughs> advance your cause, I don't think. Fair you know, enough. So any, but, you know, it's not anything operationally wrong with it. It's just like, this just sends a bad message that I think. I think it doesn't send a constructive message. But look, Elizabeth, my wife here, she said, it's not the banks that are too big to fail. It's the political parties that are too big to fail. Yeah. Yep. How, how can these parties that brought us this be the two parties giving us candidates? Awful. You know, where does this come from? And that comes back to my 60-40, the money. T 20 years ago, more than that now, I went to the Democratic Party in Florida to see if I could run for Congress. So you need 750000 Okay, well, do you care about the issues or where I stand? Is it? I say, no. We don't really care. Just as long as you have 750000 we'll take you on as a candidate. <laughs> That's terrible. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that was 20, 25 years ago. Who knows what it is now? Wow. Yeah. So that's what we're up against. We're up against political parties that there's, a, again, an institutional structure where it's not going to go to three because you're wasting your vote, and which you are. And why aren't they failing? You know, their approval ratings are under 10%. And they're still there. Why aren't they gone? Yeah. Any other business would be gone. Almost any other candidate of people would be are gone. unregistered. They're independents and they still can't crack it. Right, right, right. So, you know, that's going to require some kind of like structural change to select candidates. And one of them, the big one, I think, is the money. I really right. do. I think it comes down to that. And, you know, none of the MMT crowd is advancing that monetary solution. And, you know, since we're modern monetary theory, it's a monetary dynamic. 
you know, the whole campaign funding. And this changes the monetary dynamic the same way it changes the sequence of deficit spending, right? It's that kind of a upheaval, it's that kind of a reversal, or the interest rate thing is backwards. I mean, who would think that in the history of the world, all these central banks all over the world got the interest rate thing backwards with all the PhDs they have researching everything, but they do. And how probable is it that one guy sitting here in a pair of shorts in St. Croix knows that they don't? It's not probable at all. But, you know, he could have said that about governments being insolvent. After 30 years, that's worked its way from nothing up to, you know, $5 trillion this year is in the deficit or whatever it's going to be without a tax. So it's, it's been effective. Right. It's been from the bottom up effective. And, you know, what motivates guys like you? This thing has motivated guys like you we're getting nothing out of it. You know, you're not getting funded by the Koch no. brothers or something. No. The right wing has required enormous funding. Yes. This isn't even the left. This isn't even partisan. And it's like taking over, totally transform mainstream economics. How did the mob, how can the mob transform mainstream economic thought and logic in terms of, you know, how the money system works? Well, is that improbable or what? It's not like they changed the attitude towards unemployment or anything. It's changed their understanding of Fed operations. Okay, how does a mob of you know, people, an unruly mob, change the mainstream, you know, PhD intellectual, you know, economist understanding of Fed operations? <laughs> <laughs> but you've done that. You know, how does a guy like you calling people on the phone who don't know, you know, bond from a stock, organizing people who are really upset, change, you know, people like Krugman and Reich, changing their understanding of Fed monetary operations, <laughs> not of a populist policy. It's totally improbable that that would ever happen in that way. Right. Yeah. Something like that. Oh, we're organizing a movement here because the bankers on Wall Street don't understand how money clears at the Fed. Could you please sign on to that? <laughs> That's what happened. <laughs> okay. And it's happened. There's a grassroots movement all over the world. And it's changed their perception of how the check's clear at the Fed. Isn't that some? Yeah, and you've been part of that. Did you ever realize that's what you're a part of? Every once in a while, I pinch <laughs> myself and say, hey, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. What's going on? Yeah. Well, where's this force? This force does that? <laughs> you know, the French <laughs> Revolution was not about you know changing their understanding of how checks cleared at the French Treasury or anything. That's it's not been a big goodness. revolution. There's been a massive revolution about promoting an understanding of how you know checks clear at the Fed. What's that all about? <laughs> it's amazing is what it is. It is. Yeah. You are listening to Macro and Cheese, a podcast brought to you by Real Progressives, a nonprofit organization dedicated to teaching the masses about MMT, or modern monetary theory. Please help our efforts and become a monthly donor at PayPal or Patreon. Like and follow our pages on Facebook and YouTube, and follow us on Periscope, Twitter, and Instagram. So back to COVID, we clearly have yeah, yeah. politicians that are unwilling to move. And yeah. there is a money story in that sense, too, that you've just told. And there's yeah. a monetary solution to that possibility for fixing the yeah. way elections are funded and so forth. But let's yeah. talk about how we fund people and your response. Yeah. To so the here's COVID. the thing with COVID. Yes. My big response is we got a massive supply shock, just people not going to work and doing things. But it's a massive supply shock for non-essentials, which is kind of interesting. You know, so we don't have movie theaters. Well, okay. It doesn't create a shortage in the price of movies goes up, right? And the people are out of work. And it creates a supply shock for restaurants. Now, there aren't restaurants open where you can go eat. Almost a demand shock where people don't want to go to eat this, you know, desire to save. And people are out of work, so they're losing income. So we've got like demand and supply shock going on at the same time, but the supply shock is on non-essentials. 
So number one, and get me back to this point when I'm done here, we've cut our energy consumption in some areas, I don't know, 20, 30, 40%. We've reversed the environmental degradation process by 20, 30, 40% by eliminating non-essentials. And I think I might've talked to you about this before this whole thing started, that I thought a lot of it could be done through conservation. I thought we could get rid of half our energy consumption through conservation. I think we may have talked about this. I talked about speed limits and other things, usage of non-essentials. You know, eliminating non-essentials is conservation. We've just proven that through conservation, we've eliminated 20, 30, 40% of our environmental degradation. We didn't spend a penny on Green New Deal or anything else. We just engaged in massive conservation. And do we really want to, like, has anybody talked about, well, if everybody goes back to work, we're going to be back to the old levels of environmental degradation again. Do we want to do that? Do we want to reverse this 20, 30, 40% progress we made, which is probably more than we would have made spending $77 trillion over the next 20 years, right? If it wasn't for the COVID. Do we want to reverse all this, this huge gain? You know, maybe, you know, are we rethinking, let's restart this economy, but if they're non-essentials and they cause environmental degradation, maybe we shouldn't be doing them. Maybe we should do something else. I mean, where's this conversation? Are you hearing this anywhere? No, not at all. Pretty, not pretty compelling not. conversation. You know, if your house is full of smoke and you haven't been able to breathe for years and it's getting worse and then something happens and, you know, you give up something you realize you didn't need anyway and the smoke clears, now you say, gee, let's get back to doing what we were doing before and fill the house with smoke again? No, I don't think so. Maybe we don't want to do that. Maybe we should do something different this time than what we were doing before that caused our house to fill up with smoke, you know? But it's not even like part of the conversation anymore. And we don't have any leadership that can make it part of the conversation. We're certainly not seeing it come out of, you know, AOC or any of these people. They're onto something else now. Okay, so they're not going to be leading in that direction. I don't see the environmentalists leading in that direction. So the answer is, yes, we can go up with the financial plan to get people back to work and everything, but we can also you know, direct it. We direct it more towards people watching movies at home instead of going to the movie theaters. We save all that driving and all that movie theater stuff, you know, real resources, and we can do other things, whatever else we've been doing, so we can cut down on gasoline consumption. You know, we'll stay at the lower levels. We don't need to, like, cut back anymore. And we do. But we can just stop increasing it. You know, we don't have to increase from here. Nobody's dying now because they're not enough driving. They're not making money, but they're not dying. Okay, and all the travel and everything else. You know, okay, it's all non-essential. You know, you can still live pretty well. You don't have to do all this traveling. And you don't have to have all these meetings. Now, all of a sudden, we realize we can do it without them. Do we want to turn that back on and start having more face-to-face -face meetings and everything else and with all the environmental degradation that implies? I don't think so. I mean, I don't. It makes no more. sense to me at all. I love it like that. No. I, mean, I hate to say it, but I yes. really do enjoy working remotely. Yeah. And what would the leadership and government be doing now, moving us in that direction? Well, you know, let's get the infrastructure in place for remote working, for consumption of things that are zero marginal cost, zero, you know, energy usage or near zero. You know, like if you download more songs or watch more software or something like that, or come up with more entertainment, that doesn't have the same cost as driving around on a jet ski burning gasoline or something. You know what I'm saying? Or flying somewhere to do something. To get FAA approval, you got to have, you know, your resource consumption has to be a lot lower now because we realize, well, then we won't have as much air flight. Fine. Well, we don't have as much now. You know what? We're okay. Nobody died. We are okay. And we don't want to have more of this stuff if it's going to add more CO2 to the atmosphere or something like that. We realize that they're non-essentials. You don't have to start in with non-essentials again. We can just do with more essentials and come up with ways to do things. You know, have the think tanks coming up with ideas and legislation for things we can do where we don't degrade the environment. So anyway, the other thing is we don't have any idea because of the supply demand thing now. There are many models, I don't think, that can figure it out. How large a tax cut we should have or how large of a stimulus check we should have or how much unemployment compensation. I don't think we really know. And so 
it'd be very easy to just add two trillion and oh, that's too much. And suddenly the price level doubles and now what do we do? Or we didn't have enough. So when I designed my proposals, I designed them to all be counter cyclical. So I said, okay, $500 a week federal unemployment compensation above state and local for everybody who's out of work and cut the requirements down. If you're not working, you know, don't make it impossible for people to get unemployment compensation like we used to, you know, before this started. Let's make, you know, reasonable requirements that, you know, for this thing. What that means is that if that's enough demand and if it becomes safe to go to work and if we have supply side things that we're allowed that are not, you know, degrading the environment and now more people are being hired, then it's kind of cyclical. So the, the $500 payments might add up to a trillion the first year. Once everybody goes back to work, they go to zero. And so whatever it is will go away when things recover. So therefore, you're automatically going to cut back as things recover and you don't have the risk of overdoing it. Okay, see what I'm saying? Absolutely, so, yep. Yeah, so I said, look, we should give all the state and local governments money on a per capita basis so it's not political. That's another thing. That hasn't even been discussed. It's entirely apolitical if you get $1,000 per person goes to your state treasury as a federal transfer payment. Not to the person, but to the state treasury. So if you've got 40 million people like California, you get 40 billion. You got 4 million people, you get 4 billion. Okay, and so it's just on a per capita basis. Now you don't have red states paying for blue states or you're not rewarding bad behavior. Or, you know, if somebody's had good behavior, they've got the money to spend on good things. If somebody's had bad behavior, they've got to pay interest to bills and put in their pension fund or something, right? And the other guys can have new buses and trains, whatever, new roads. So it's not like there's no moral hazard doing it if it's done on a per capita basis. This hasn't even been proposed that way. To me, that would break the whole logjam. But how much do you give the state? So you give them enough to replace their lost revenues, and you go by the worst state to give them enough for their lost revenue, and then you just scale it all up per capita. So if another state gets extra, fine. You know, nobody's paying for it. The worst state gets the same money per capita. They just, unfortunately, for the worst state. So they got to use it for necessities. The other state gets to use it for new stuff, whatever you want to call it. You know, enhancements. And then you give them enough for three months revenue. And then at the end of three months, if things are still the way they are, you give them another three months. That way they don't have to cut back on the police. They don't have to cut back on school teachers. They don't have to cut back on whatever else they're now cutting back on. So you maintain your state and local services. To me, that's easy. It's counter-cyclical because as your tax revenues pick up, you just look at what they need for replacement and it goes down. And it scales out as in response to their revenues. Same way unemployment does. So those two things to me were critical for the COVID recovery financial plan. Those were the pillars of it to get counter cyclical funding in place now that's not too little, not too much, and probably pretty close. And then you can always fine tune from there if you have a larger problem. The other thing, Social Security, I think the minimum should just be $2,000 a month for all. Everybody over age, whatever, 65 or 70, whatever we think the retirement age should be. And to we don't have seniors as part of them. You know, and there's no moral hazard there. It's not like, oh, you know, I'm going to get 2000 a month when I get to age 70. So I'm only 30, but I'm not going to work. It's like, there is no connection. There's no channel like that. And that shores up all of our seniors. And we don't have a problem with, you know, desperation at that level. We also should be going Medicare for all, right? Just lower the age from 65 to zero. It's a deflationary event, put a lot of people out of work. But that just means we don't need a tax increase right now. And we're going to have the $500 additional federal compensation. We're going to have a job guarantee to help transition to the private sector. We're going to be working on ways to create schools that are safe to go into for kids to learn or some kind of remote learning where there's social interaction, which we don't have now, whether it's electronic or whether it's face-to-face -face kids and that protects the teachers and protects everybody else and fund it all properly, and we're going to have ways to travel that's safe. Maybe we can't do as much of it, but what we have, it's going to be safe. So ways to make the subway safe in New York City so that uh, people can 
body if we want to. It might not make sense to do that. But anyway, there's like nobody even beginning to think about those things that I've seen. I really don't have the answers. I only have, you know, questions for discussion, really. These are mostly questions I'm posing for discussion. Sure. Proposals to, just to get this discussion started. But I guess that's a better way to put it. This yeah. is how we get the discussion started. So block grants have been around forever. This is not an unfamiliar yeah. territory. The country used to do this yeah. stuff back in the 70s. Were they per capita to all the states? No, no, no. I'm saying that they had like a kind of pseudo revenue sharing of sorts. Yeah, yeah, no. But the arguments get into how do you do it equitably? And nobody suggested per capita. No, the right. states got together, formed this. They had their own monetary systems and they formed the central government and decided the monetary system is best there. But if they then quote, you know, credit money back to the states on a per capita basis, they haven't done anything. You know what I mean? They haven't like acted out of line or anything like that. That's what they're there for. That's what the state centralized the money for, that they could have it all one place and have it available, you know, to benefit the states. The states are the beneficiaries of the federal government. Sure, that's you know, what I was and, saying. And, and, I'm in agreement. Trump's there saying, oh, you know, this is federal stuff. This is not for the states. But the whole federal government's for the states. That's why it's there. He doesn't have the ability to understand the core principles behind anything. He only has first order understanding like a six-year-old. And that, that's, <laughs> yeah, and now others have the understanding, but they're diabolical and they try and you know, undermine it. Trump it really just, he doesn't even have the understanding. Right. So he's like, no, there's no chance. It's like a bastardized Tenth Amendment type of crankery, just as bad as money crankery. You got constitution yeah. crankery. So yes, absolutely. It's not even crankery. It's just too hard for him. <laughs> you never got that far. It's like trying to explain the first grader how the stuff works. He just glasses over. You know, he can only understand well, if I'm nice to you, then you'd be nice to me. You know, at first order quid pro quo stuff. That's all you know is the sixth grader. Right. Okay, what are you going to do for me if I do this for you? you know, that's where you are. That's and that's called the rest of development. He never got past that. It's not his fault. You know, it's like if you're watching a football game or a basketball game and you're dropping the ball and it's kind of funny and you're laughing, then you realize it's the Special Olympics. Well, it's not funny anymore. You look at it differently. Okay, Trump is like somebody in the Special Olympics. It's not funny. It's just like, fine, you know, he's doing that. It's nice to have him a chance and all that, but it should be president. Right. Yeah, it is ugly. There's no getting around it. I mean, we've got the worst of all worlds. We've got a guy who is just absolutely inept and corrupt yeah. and absolutely unstable. And on the other hand, we got a guy absolutely no one wanted and they rigged a primary for yeah. And then the person that came in last yeah. place is the vice president. And then the person that nobody wanted and didn't even campaign is suddenly thrust not, past the person everyone not only, wanted. Not only the person came in last, the person that who made the most vicious cheap shot attack on him in the first debate that you can imagine. Yep. You know, out of context, entirely like, this is within a political party to do that. You know, that was like enough to get you thrown out of the party. You want to do an attack, fine, you know, be professional about it. That was just horrible. And that's what we got, yeah. That's gross. It doesn't make me feel good to look at my son and I say, Gene, I am so sorry I failed you. I failed you miserably to yeah. allow Biden to even sniff the White House or Trump. And it's just disgusting. I mean, I feel like a failed human being that these people are even yeah. in existence, much less running for president yeah. of our United States. Awful. Yeah. Awful. Yeah. Yeah. But look, well, like Don Rumsfeld used to say, you got to fight with the army you got. <laughs> yeah. And Trump's got to get out of there right now. And then we're going to have to deal with what comes next. I hope that the typical bougie Democrat approach, which is to go back to sleep and defend blue like the police defend blue, doesn't happen the day after. Because that right there is, for many of us, it's a fate worse than death. You know, we can't wait around for that. And the austerity that Democrats like to do, they fancy themselves to be fiscally responsible and they're repairing yeah. the damage of irresponsibility of the Republicans. And and then they go in there and make us eat our peas and really hurt us very, very badly. When and, I talk to Bernie Sanders, okay. Oh, God, yes. Yep, go ahead. <laughs> you know, you're going here. Medicare for all. Yep. I told him how it didn't need a tax increase because it's deflationary. 
you know, it's like I've been a fiscal conservative all my life. I'm not going to change now. Yeah. <laughs> it's scary. What, what's that all about? How in the world did Stephanie not penetrate that? Such a presence. How how did she not be able to overcome that? Not her fault. I mean, how is it? (laughs) She got everything across. She more than got everything across. Just wouldn't go there. Damn, they Christmas. What a shame. And his aides all all got it. I was there with them. You know, the guys working for him, they were good people. But when he starts talking, they just start rolling their eyes. and, And he's the best we got. That's the thing. Again, you got to fight with the army you got. Right. Yeah. Yep. It's an ugly picture. But Warren, let me ask you one final question. You're getting ready to do a thing out there in Scotland. I see Stephanie has been involved with trying to help create the currency freedom out there in Scotland. And I'm just curious, you're about to speak out there. What can you tell us about Scotland? Well, it's on Zoom and they want to separate. I, I was with Quebec. I, I put up a monetary plan for them in the 90s. I think They only missed by like a couple of votes, but um, it's the same kind of thing. So I named the new currency the kilt. And you know why? No idea. Oh. <laughs> okay, what's the first thing everybody asks about a currency? They want to know what's behind it, right? <laughs> <laughs> They're going to call it the kilt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's great. Okay. <laughs> that was worth the price of admission right there, Warren. All right. <laughs> well, the other thing they have is what they call the common wheel, W-E-A-L. <laughs> have you heard that? No, I have It's like the Commonwealth. I entitled the presentation Reinventing the Wheel. <laughs> W-E-A-L. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my so, God. So the anti- a lot of them think they should just go with British pounds. And they say, if you go with your own currency, you're going to have currency depreciation and inflation. You're going to turn into Venezuela. And so my idea on how you go to your own currency is a way where that doesn't happen. And so I made that presentation. So they want me to do it again to this next group, kind of a repeat of what I did when I was over there a couple of years ago. And so far, Stephanie and myself, we've just been kind of advisors on the letterhead. So this is my first actual participation in something since I was over there with Bill Mitchell made a presentation. We both made presentations on starting a currency and they're getting the usual objections. You know, they have a trade deficit or this or that, which I don't even know what it is because there's no real reliable records of what Scotland's trade gap is any more than there is for Connecticut versus, you know, New York or something. Because they're all provinces within the UK. They don't know what they're current account, you know, financial transfers. Well, that's all going to change when you have your own currency. So they're using these numbers that some organization came up with showing they have a massive current account deficit. So therefore, if they have their own currency, it's going to go down. Well, only if you started at a level that's too high, right? <laughs> Until it make a one-time adjustment to the new level. It doesn't like just go down forever because there's a deficit this year. And their range on the deficit, if you look at the details, anywhere from you know, one to 10%. So they're using the 10% as sensational. Well, what if it is? What if this happens? So anyway, so I've got a whole thing about, A, it doesn't matter anyway, but B, how the debits and credits work through on all that. So it's not a problem. And I've gotten through to a lot of knowledgeable people, you know, I think former people in finance, Bank of England types or Bank of Scotland types have been on board promoting my proposal and they just want me to talk to, you know, and support Right. Well, I look forward to catching up. When I saw that, it got really exciting. Obviously, there's MMT Scotland out there and trying to make some connections with those folks and just keep an eye on it to see how it goes. There's some opportunities here in the States too, Warren, the indigenous folks on the reservations. They have a real opportunity to establish a currency of their own and yeah. to be able to understand how to do a balance of payments between the United States and their own sovereign yeah. territory. So this is another opportunity right here. I did a presentation on it years ago up in Ottawa for the indigenous nations. I think they called them up there to do exactly that. And there were a couple of people promoting it, you know, in parliament, but that's as far as it got. Right. Well, Warren, I want to thank hard. you so, so much for taking what amounts yeah. to be 
many hours. I'm blown away. I just looked down at my watch and I'm like, wow, we have been talking for a while. <laughs> Did anybody while. listen to all this? You better believe it. And let me just tell you, for our listeners, folks, now that we've gone to our website instead of using the old platform, we have been able to break through so many barriers with this heterodox type show here. We've been able to reach a huge audience. Our listenership has more than tripled in the last two months. And it's really a testament to the voices and the subject matter that we've been able to bring to the table. And Warren, you, sir, are the origin of all of this. And I really cannot tell you how much I appreciate your work, Bill's, Randy's, Stephanie's, the whole gang, everybody, Follow Scott, Matt, you all have done such great work and you nailed it. I don't get paid a lick for doing this. We're a nonprofit, so we survive by donations. But I do this because I'm so passionate about seeing the changes happen. and. Yeah. It can't happen fast enough. Yeah. It probably won't happen in my lifetime, but... Look, you've got Stephanie and Bill and Randy. They've dedicated 25 years to this, their whole life. Yes. I mean, it's not just like a little hobby. No. Their whole persona as academics just defines them. Right. And the new one's coming up. I mean, they've got their own whatever, but defining their persona with this. And, you know, the raw numbers now, obviously, to make this almost common knowledge, tells you that support that they've garnered doing what they're doing. Now, I can talk to a few people at a time, but they're the ones who really got to mass numbers of people, large yes. numbers of people through their own media, through their own you know, accomplishments, through their own presentations. And I mean, nonstop, nonstop. You know how much Bill writes. Oh, it's you, crazy. You don't want to look at Stephanie's travel schedule about how many different people she talked to and how many people in Washington. He didn't just sit around watching TV in Washington. She was out constantly with all the different, you know, financial type of elites and political elites going through this stuff. I mean, you have to kiss a lot of frogs to get where we are. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, look, Warren, thank you so okay. much for this. I really appreciate yeah. it immensely. And yes, by the way, people will actually listen. So with that, okay. this is Steve Grumbine, Warren Mosler from Macro and Cheese. Thank you, folks. We're out of here. Macro and Cheese is produced by Andy Kennedy. Descriptive writing by Virginia Cox and promotional artwork by Mindy Donham. Macro and Cheese is publicly funded by our Real Progressive Patreon account. If you would like to donate to Macro and Cheese, please visit patreon.com slash real progressives. I want the truth!